Hello and welcome to the Ed Berry, Edward T. Berry Ice Rink for the 56th Annual Codfish Bowl Tournament Championship Game. It's going to go down as one of the oddest codfish bowls in the history of this long tournament. Just two games yesterday, UMass Boston beating the University of Rhode Island club team in an exhibition game, 5 nothing, out shooting the Rams 65-11. Five different scores for the Beacons, three different players with a goal and an assist. None of that will go down in their season statistics. The second game was postponed mere hours before it was supposed to happen. Franklin Pierce University unable to travel. Let us know at about 1.30 yesterday. Post already on their way up to face their fellow Division II and Northeast 10 Conference member. Post still made the trip, and they will take on UMass Boston today in the de facto championship game. UMass Boston looking to win their sixth ever Codfish Bowl title, and their first since January 5th, 2014. For Post, they're in a championship game without having played a game. This is their first ever Codfish Bowl appearance, first ever Codfish Bowl game, and they've got a chance to win a title if they can pull off the upset against UMass Boston. The Beacons come in at 6-5-1 and one on the year. 3-2-1 and one in one of the toughest conferences in the entire Division Three nation, the New England Hockey Conference. Post plays at Division Two. not as many teams. They play in the Northeast 10 where all the rest of their teams play. 4-5, and 3-2 and two, though. They sit second overall in the Northeast 10 Conference. Impressive considering they were picked seventh out of seven teams. First ever meeting between these two teams. The Beacons have not played a team out of the NE10 since November 24th, 2018, when they faced former assistant coach Sean Walsh, and he pulled off the upset 2-1 as Southern New Hampshire defeated the Beacons in the opening game of the 2018 Manchester PAL Stovepipe Tournament. For post, they've played just three games against teams out of the New England Hockey Conference, one and two, a split against Johnson and Wales, and a loss to Skidmore College back in 2018-19 in Skidmore's Thanksgiving tournament. Looking at these two sides, post just a seventh-year program, only in their second year of being within a conference, and typically that helps to kind of formulate a schedule and bring in more recruits. Post has been led the entire seven seasons by Pete Whitney, who was a former assistant coach in Connecticut at the Gunnery School, and they've got a very familiar face on the bench, if you're familiar with UMass Boston, Tim Richter, who was a very successful four-year player with the Beacons, including a 2012-13 senior season when he went off for 26 points in 27 games. He's been an assistant with the program ever since it started. He went to Connecticut and played in Danbury to play some professional hockey and stayed in Connecticut and he is the lead assistant for Pete Whitney also of note uh, a former teammate of Richter's Anthony Fitty who played on the UMass Boston men's hockey and lacrosse team is the head coach of the men's lacrosse program there so a couple of ties between the two teams looking at this post team it's very simple for them they've got to score to win this year they are 0-5 when scoring two or less goals 4-0 when scoring four or more goals. So it'll be very interesting to see for Post. They haven't played in just under three weeks. If they can get some goals today against the UMass Boston team that limited a pretty good URI club team, granted at the club level, but nationally ranked, has been extremely strong over the past couple decades uh, to just 11 shots and very few good scoring chances for the Beacons. They have been haunted in this tournament in a couple in very close games in championship games. Since winning back-to-back -back Codfish Bowls, their fourth and fifth all-time in 2013 and 14, they've made the championship game in four of the past six tournaments, but have won zero. Four of those, in those four championship games, they've lost all four by a single, well, three of the four by a single goal and have been limited to just two goals. So can the Beacons get goals? It's kind of the, the, uh, the big key for both of these sides. Can either team get to three goals for two very different reasons? Right now, while we've got a moment, let's take a look at the highlights from yesterday's game. It was pretty easy sailing for the Beacons, a 5-0 victory over the URI club team, who was supposed to be playing in today's consolation game, but we don't have a fourth team, so it'll just be the two games to decide the champion of this 56th annual Codfish Bowl tournament. When the morning comes, we see what we've become. 
Quick look at the stats for these two sides. You can see UMass Boston, a much better scoring offense, but they have struggled with their scoring defense. Shots, UMass Boston has a big advantage. The power play will be very interesting. Post has really scuffled on the power play as of late. 0 for their last 12 on the season, operating at less than 10%. But their PK has been pretty good, allowing just one goal over their past three games. Be interesting to see if the Beacons can take advantage. One for three on the power play yesterday. Quickly, we're going to look at our players to watch. First for UMass Boston, as the Beacons will rely heavily on one of their newcomers who had a goal and an assist yesterday. It's Nolan Barrett. Goal and assist yesterday, already eight points in 11 games. He's the Nick Albano replacement and has been really strong. On the opposite side for Suffolk, rather for Post, excuse me, it's Kieran Gardner, the team's leading scorer, three goals, four assists, seven points, listed as a defenseman. He's the top line left winger out of Ashburn, Virginia, played his junior hockey with the New Hampshire Junior Monarchs. He's the team's tied for the leading scorer, but Brandon Crowther, who also has seven points, unavailable today, is close without two of their leading 
offensive options, Crowther and Evan Lugo, who has not been as proficient scoring this season as he has in his first three seasons. The senior with 62 career points, has played in all nine games this year, but unavailable today. Beacons in their home whites with the blue pants and blue trim going from left to right on your computer screen or TV. Post in their road orange jerseys as a shot from the point gets knocked down. That was Ethan Nicken. The Beacons changing up their second and third lines today. Jeffrey Skinner, Andy Walker, and Ethan Nicken out there. Third line is Alex Duncan, Owen Bordeaux back into the lineup, and Dakota Concanon. Just two changes in the lineup as that shot whipped just wide by Barrett. Scored the opening goal in yesterday's win over the URI club team. Puck dumped in, and chasing and getting there first is Skinner. Skinner had a goal in the victories. The shot from distance easily saved there by Brandon Brown, the senior captain out of Hanahan, South Carolina, who has played pretty much every game since arriving on campus. In fact, he's played in 71 of 85 games and has started all but one game this season. There's an icing called against the Beacons just a minute and 13 in. Brown on the year, 477 15 of a possible 539 minutes. 3-4 and four with a 3.27 goals against average. 906 save percentage. 251 saves versus 26 goals against. He's made 30 or more saves in each of his last five, including a season-high 37 saves and a 4-3 win over Franklin Pierce on the 16th of November. For UMass Boston, Sam Best gets the start for the second straight day with Connor McNanima unavailable. Beacons giving chase as the top line of Devin Moran, Ty Matthews, and Chris Peters. Matthews, who scored two goals and added an assist on November the 6th against New England College, and has been out ever since, had a goal and assist yesterday in that win against URI. None of the stats count, but certainly a good sign for a player who was looking good through his first three games and then was sidelined for a, a number of sicknesses nothing COVID related but certainly some scary stuff that kept him away from the team for the entire month of November defensive zone draw here and it's the Beacons third line Owen Bordeaux who was not in the lineup yesterday back in there today as he replaces Patrick McCoy the only other change for the Beacons Ethan Osborne is the extra skater the seventh defenseman today for the Beacons replacing Davis Browning no changes for post then again they did not play in yesterday's games they were automatically pushed to the championship game after Franklin Pierce was forced to postpone puck comes all the way out to the blue line and it's eventually picked up there by Casey Sturgeon who's making his collegiate debut out of Saranac Lake New York good shot from Alex Duncan the third line left winger out there with Bordeaux and Concanon but another save for Brown two and a half minutes in no score first ever meeting between these two sides first ever codfish bowl game for post for UMass Boston looking for that elusive sixth ever title trying to earn a tie with Boston State for the second most ever Cod Fishbowl Championship games we've got a what looked like a hand pass potentially on post and Puck will go back into their zone my name is Seth Aransky bring you all the action here on day two it'll be the second line Four post out there against the Beacons fourth line. Gino Carabelli, Coley Bankowskis, and Jake Adkins. Adkins unable to win it over for a teammate. Knocked down in the neutral zone and collected here by Nico Grolman, one of a pair of players on this post team who attended the Gunnery School where, again, head coach Peter Whitney was an assistant for 11 seasons before taking over at post. So certainly a connection between the two programs. It'll be Connor Barter to take this face off against Bankowskis, who wins it cleanly. Bankowskis has been all over the Beacons lineup. Played some time on the first, second, third, and now fourth line, and one of the fastest skaters that you'll see all season. The Beacons have to touch up. Coming up with it and losing it is Engdahl. Now it's Bankowskis takes a shot that goes off of Engdahl and back behind the post net all the way out to the blue line where it's kept in by Pat Keegan. Keegan avoids a big hit. Behind the net for Gino Carabelli, who was one of the three players, rather five players who scored a goal yesterday, did not add an assist. 
for UMass Boston, it was McCoy, Matthews, and Barrett with the goal and assist each in their first ever Codfish Bowl game. Shot from Bankowskis, saved from the high slot. Second effort from Carabelli's knocked down again. Brandon Brown has been very active just as the URI goalie was yesterday. 60 saves on 65 shots, including 19 or more in each of the three periods. Big hit in the neutral, or rather in the defensive zone, and that's Walker on Barter. Barrett loses the puck, had no reinforcements, and it's Engdahl going the other way with it. Engdahl gains the zone, immediately met by two beacons. It's Andy Walker, not one of the bigger players on the beacons roster, but he's looking to get physical early on. Barrett whiffs on the pass. It allows Patrick Murphy to pick it up and a chance for Post to maybe establish himself in the zone. They haven't done much of that here in the first five minutes. Three players there for Post, two for the Beacons, and eventually to be collected by Nolan Barrett. Barrett looks up, and the New Jersey native will send it all the way to the far side where it's collected by Michael Krupinski, his defensive partner. And that one came, tipped up, and actually caught what looks like the Post trainer. Hopefully he's okay. No one to really take care of him. And he's going to check on himself there as... He appears to be okay. Got the second line for both teams, Walker versus Grohlman, and another faceoff win cleanly there for Walker. Krupinski will dump it in, giving chase there is Skinner working against Harrison Sheldon, one of the two captains on this Eagle side. Sheldon pushes it forward and was aiming for Jake Raleigh, the North Carolina native. Raleigh with the puck now, being badgered there by Ethan Nickin. Raleigh Twink. Turns, swerves, and eventually will push it out to the beacon zone. Difficult spot there for Krupinski. He was able to avoid the pressure from Boyce and push it behind the net. But Post has certainly been able to get a little bit of more zone time. Here's Walker, a nifty move to evade one player. Walker with speed gains the red line. Walker still with it as the beacons just barely stay on side. Walker turns, swerves, loses an edge. Has Skinner right behind him. Skinner and Walker converge on the puck. And it'll be picked up by Nickin, the third member of that line. Finally, Post will pick it up, and they'll get out of the zone. This is Trey DeLore, who stands at six foot six, easily the tallest player on Post. Joe Petrozella will push it out, and the Beacons' top line comes out there. It's Matthews gaining the zone. Matthews trying to get a shot off, and does. Good save from Brown there with the blocker. Helt looked at a shot from distance and said, finds Matthews, just whips it wide. Held all the way to the far side. Good work there from the Beacons. Graduate student captain knocked down, and Peters couldn't connect on the shot. Second effort gets a piece of it, but Brown again able to make the save. Almost 10 minutes in, and thus far the story has been Brandon Brown. Beacons are creating the chances. Backhand chance from Matthews. Puck still loose, and finally a whistle. Our referees in this contest... Alex Germany, Wald, and Jeff McCorkle. The linesman, Ryan Turner, and Ben Gosselin. 13.35 to go in the first period. The Beacons are creating good looks, just have not been able to get one past Brandon Brown to this point. UMass Boston's third line out there against the top line of post. Crape being able to win the faceoff and skating out with speed here is Michael Karras. Harris out of Parker, Colorado. This post team actually has more players out of the state of Massachusetts than UMass Boston does. They've got eight of their 27 players. A lot of New England guys, decent amount of Connecticut, a couple of New Hampshire's as well. It's Osborne, one of two Beacons defensemen out of the state of Arizona, fighting with a pair of Eagles. It's finally collected there by Patrick Murphy, the Londonderry, New Hampshire native, still battling with Osborne. Bordeaux had a chance to pick it up, and Dakota Concanon finally able to knock it out of the zone. Osborne will look to settle, and that ends up in the Beacons penalty box, and we'll get a stoppage and a faceoff just outside of the Beacons zone. 12.48 to go. UMass Boston head coach Peter Belial in his 16th season, looking for win number 214 and for Codfish Bowl win number three. He would have three of the Beacon six titles. They won for the first time in 1983, added a win in 97, 2007, 2013, and 2014. So this would actually be win number four for him. He'd have four of the six if the Beacons can come away with the title today. 
Carabelli leaving it off for Bankowski. It's looking to the backhand. Look for the feed from Carabelli. We've got a penalty. And the question is, is it Carabelli for running the goalie or for one of the two post players for potentially hooking him there and not allowing him to get the shot off? And we'll see who's going. Carabelli got into some extracurriculars. Brown is still down in his net. And we should see our first power play of the day. The question is, which way is it going? Easily could see it going in favor of the Beacons. Carabelli did run the goalie, but that's because he couldn't get his stick down. And Peter Belisle right now is really angry. And I can't tell if it's a Carabelli or the ref. It is a Carabelli because Gino got into it a bit with a couple post players. To this point, we finally have someone in the box. It's going to be Tommy Boyce for what should be a hooking or holding call. And the Beacons will go to the power play for the first time today. On the season for UMass Boston, pretty strong power play. Well over 20%. Opposite side, though. This is a post team that operates at 86.5% on the PK. 32 of 37. So first opportunity for either side after Boyce is whistled. It's the Beacon's top unit as Matthews connects there with Nickin who tipped it off the crossbar. Great look in the opening 12 seconds. Matthews, Nickin, Barrett out there with Peters and Morant. So the Beacon's top line alongside Nickin and their top offensive defenseman. Chris Peters behind the Beacons net. He's the Beacons top point scorer this year with five goals and 12 assists. Beacons top goal scorer is Ethan Nickin, number 18. He's got six of them. Peters trying to go backside for Matthews. Pass gets knocked around a couple times, but Ty Matthews, the freshman of Auburn Mass, will come up with a puck. Right back over for Barrett. These two connected yesterday for the opening goal. Now it's Peters, who was looking for a shot more than we're used to seeing with a minute to go on the power play. Backside for Matthews. Good coverage thus far from Post. Glove save. Pucks loose and poked home. It's going to be Ethan Nick in his team leading seventh goal of the season. And UMass Boston takes advantage of the puck loose in the crease. Brown had no idea where it was. Nick in the first one to it. And off the shot from Matthews on the far side, UMass Boston able to open the scoring here in the 56th annual Codfish Bowl championship game. Nick in his seventh goal of the season to go along with five assists, 12 total points. Now up to 50 points for his collegiate career. 50 points in 61 games. Bankowskis giving chase as Post after giving up that penalty, trying to turn the tide a bit. It's Carabelli and the Beacons fourth line right back out there. They're going to wave off icing here. Held unable to connect with Carabelli. Shot gets whipped upon, but picked right back up by Murphy behind the net. Top line out there for Post versus the Beacons fourth. And here comes Bankowskis, and this is what he does best. Skates and just creates chances there is Brown able to make the shoulder save in an offensive zone draw but once he gets started it is very difficult to slow him down 10 45 to go in period number one the power play goal from Ethan Nickin the difference thus far Brandon Brown made the initial stop couldn't hold on and the puck was loose the referees clearly saw it and then Ethan Nickin was able to pounce on the puck got there first there was a mad scramble in front face off win for post there and they'll push it out with speed Ryan Mosier and the fourth line out there for the Eagles UMass Boston going with the third line of Duncan Bordeaux and Concanic behind the net Krupinski pushes off one player able to feed Alex Duncan and Duncan will push it out into the neutral zone where we've got another penalty the second in about three minutes on post and another power play chance for UMass Boston Let's see who the guilty party is this time. It's going to be Nico Grohlman, the senior out of Laguna Niguel, California. So Grohlman to the box. Top unit will come right back out there for UMass Boston as they've had about a minute, minute and a half rest.
Good face-off win there by Ryan Mosier, the fourth line right winger out of Queensbury, New York. Matthews whiffs on the shot. Nickin almost collected it. Poor clearance allows the Meekins to control. It's Justin Brown didn't get anything behind that one. Brown, the extra skater today for the Eagles out there on the PK. Very valuable spot if you can do it. Again, Brown gets nothing behind the clearance, but the Meekins can't keep it in along the far side, and Pulse will... Clear it down the length of the ice. Post will get four new skaters. And the Beacons have already have elected to keep this same group out there. Barrett around one player. Knocks into another. Now it's Matthews. Two on one. Lex to shoot there. He had Peters to his right. Puck gets poked loose. Devin Moran first one to it. Moran tape to tape pass there for Matthews, who's dispossessed for a moment. Moran looking for a passing option out top for Barrett. Once this shot gets knocked down, Puck still loose, a chance to clear, and it, the attempted clearance got knocked away there. Jack Engdahl couldn't get anything behind it. Peters passed to a player who gets knocked down. That was Nickin, and now it's cleared down the length of the ice by Nick Brewer. Still 46 seconds to go on the man advantage. The Beacons one for one thus far, looking to add a second power play goal here in the first period. Barrett just out of the reach of Walker. Puck gets knocked right to the tape there of Skinner. The shot gets popped up in the air off of Brown and eventually cleared out as far as the red line. Barrett has stayed out there the entire minute and 36 seconds thus far of the power play, but the rest of the group has changed. It's Krupinski, Walker, Duncan, Skinner, and here comes the fifth member. It's Joe Petrozella. Walker for Duncan, and now up top for Krupinski. Quick shot right into the chest, and Brown will hold on. 8.30 to play in period number one. Seven seconds to go on this second power play opportunity after the penalty to Nico Grohlman. Beacons. Well, I'd like to bring on the fourth line here. It'll be Bankowskis working against Jake Raleigh. Bankowskis, the clean win. Shot from Petrozella gets knocked down. Adkins had a little bit of an opening, but just misses the far post with Brown having all kinds of traffic in front of him. Krupinski, the Texas native, will push it into the post zone. And here comes pressure from Adkins. Bankowskis with it, leaves it off for Petrozella. Shot doesn't get all the way through. Good shot block from Sheldon. Now it's Krupinski looking for Carabelli on the near side. This fourth line's created some chances today. Coming the other way with speed is Grohlman. Dishes it off. We've got an offside. Grohlman looked like he was going to take it in himself. The last second passed it off for Boyce. And I think the third man into the zone, Raleigh, was a bit surprised. And that allowed the Beacons to catch post offside there. Top line out there for Post. For the Beacons, it'll be the third line. And it's Bordeaux with the faceoff win. Far side, Osborne gets the red line and will dump it in as the Beacons give chase. Duncan in there working against Harris. Puck still loose. Three Post players against two Beacons. Alex Duncan collects. Played his junior hockey in Connecticut. Was a Danbury hat trick player last season. Bordeaux all the way up top for Helt. Helt to the slot. Shot doesn't get through a sea of bodies. It's knocked down and collected by Patrick Murphy, whose pass is knocked away, and then right back to Crapian and Post. Big hit right below us, and the cheers, that's coming from the players. There are no fans for this week's Codfish Bowl tournament with the rise in Omicron as of late. It's Walker gaining the zone. Andy Walker slow, shoots it in, rebound comes loose, but bounces away from Jeffrey Skinner, who is in their backside. Great lead pass out there for Barter, whose shot goes wide, and then he's turned by Barrett after the play. Not enough for a call, according to this referee crew. By far the best chance thus far for Post is that was Connor Barter, who does have a goal this season in eight games. Lead pass finds Skinner. Skinner had Walker. Skating towards the back post, unable to find him. It's Nick in the goal scorer, battling behind the net with Nick Brewer. Nick in gets knocked down. 6:27 to go here in the first period. UMass Boston leads this championship game 1-0 on a power play goal, and they have really controlled this first period. Chances have been at a premium 
for Post, not so much for the Beacons. Shot from Keegan all the way through. Brown makes the save rebound loose, and the shot from Walker is knocked away by Barter. Post has done a really good job of getting in front of some of these Beacons looks from distance. Engdahl avoids the big hit, gets it back, gets back to his skates, but unable to keep control of the puck as we're under six minutes to go now. Barrett just behind there of Matthews and collecting to keep it himself here will be Pat Keegan who's dispossessed just past the blue line. Not exactly what you want to see if you're the Beacons coaching staff. Only two of their four coaches here at the Edward T. Barry Ice Rink this week. Head coach Peter Belisle and head assistant coach Sean Pauley. Ty Matthews, long stretch pass, looking for Devin Moran, broken up right at the red line. And this has been better from post, minimizing the Beacons' chances, making it more difficult for them to break out. Krupinski turns, swivels, and he'll feed it ahead for Peters as the Beacons' top line looks to get something going. Peters pushed off the puck there, giving chase on Delore. He turns it over, and Peters couldn't hold on. Now it's Matthews in tight with the shot, another save for Brown, but from a difficult angle. We've got a whistle, and I think the Beacons are going to be whistled for their first penalty as Matthews looks frustrated. And nope, it's just going to be the net off its moorings. Matthews frustrated by his inability to find the back of the net there. Played well. Had three points in his last official contest that counted. Goal and an assist yesterday against the URI club team. So he's had the hot hand despite going... Almost two months between those two games. Shot from the far side from Ryan Rowland, who's paired with Michael Krupinski today. First time I've called his name. That one got knocked down as we're under five minutes to go in the period. Working with it here is Boyce. Boyce pushes it ahead for Chase Lapworth, and Sam Best has to play the puck for one of the few times this week. Very little work yesterday, and pretty much the same today. Forced to make just two saves yesterday, and then you don't really want to skate into Michael Krupinski as the smaller Ryan Mosier tried to go after him, and Krupinski just gave him a little bit of a forearm shiver and pushed him to the ice. This game has been a little bit chippy. We saw it early on after the Beacons earned their first penalty of the game, and Carabelli charged into Brandon Brown, couldn't slow himself down. Post wasn't happy, so there was some pushing and shoving after the play. Well, it's continued. It's got to be a frustrating week for Post. It's, there you've got a little bit of an ice shower on Sam Best from Kieran Gardner. Made the long drive up yesterday only to find out they didn't have a game. Obviously exciting to play for a championship, but for them they haven't played in three weeks, and they've kind of been on the back foot here in the first period. The Beacons dominating the chances and having both of the power plays thus far. It's Duncan with two players to his left. Duncan gains the zone, still working with it. And behind the net now, looks for the wraparound backhand chance and it's saved by Brown at the far post with 4.01 to go in the period. And we'll see the Beacons go with the fourth line. Post is going to make some adjustments as well. Looks like it's going to be the second line for post. Boyce, Grohlman, and Raleigh for the Beacons, Carabelli, Bankowskis, and Adkins. Bankowskis is arguably their best face-off man, so look for them to go with a set play. Keegan's lined up right behind him, and Barrett to the far side, but a clean win there for post, and they'll push it out the other way. Pat Keegan behind his own net, the freshman out of Maynard, Massachusetts. Here comes Bankowskis, who's tripped up, but not enough for a call this time. Carabelli swings it all the way out top for Barry, who's being pressured. Back for Keegan. Keegan down low as Bankowskis loses his stick. It flew up in the air. Here comes Carabelli, content to just dump it down low. Bankowskis giving chase with 3.30 to go in the period. Huge hit by Carabelli, but it came up high. And I think Gino's going to be called for an elbowing or a hit through the head. Looks like it was going to be clean. And at the last possible second, it did appear to come up high. And Gino Carabelli is going to go to the box for two minutes. 
First power play opportunity for Post, who's had three weeks to work on a power play that has been scuffling. 9.5% on this season. 4 for 42, 0 for 11 their last three games, 0 for their last 12. Chase Lapworth, the fourth line center, will take the face off. He's out there with Connor Barter, Jake Raleigh, Michael Karras, and looks like Trey DeLore. For the Beacons, the four penalty killers to start, Bankowskis, Nickin, Roland, and Krupinski. Karras will dump it all the way around. Good work. It comes all the way out to the blue line, and Krupinski able to tip that shot from DeLore wide. Krupinski finds Nickin, and now Bankowskis is trying to fly the zone. And a good knockdown there by Karras, who had Bankowskis racing past him. Puck poked loose. Delory gains the zone, looking for options to Lapworth, and Best probably made his best save of the period thus far, coming out, closing the angle, and easily making the stop on Lapworth with a minute 16 to go on the man advantage and 2.33 to go in this first period here on the Beacons Broadcast Network and LittleEast.tv. Second unit out there now for Post. Krapian loses the faceoff to Duncan. Duncan joined out there with, for the Beacons by Helt, Adkins, and what looks like Keegan, who's doing a great job pinning the puck along the boards. Duncan will push the puck into the post zone, and it'll force Nick Brewer to retreat to play it. Under 50 seconds to go on the man advantage. Just over two minutes to go in the period. First power play chance for Post as they trail 1-0 on a power play goal for the Beacons. Ethan Nickin scored that one. Less than 10 minutes in as Keegan is tied up there with a, an eagle. That was the much smaller John Crapian. And Crapian back up. Two escapes with 20 seconds to go after the Beacons clear the puck. Roland ties up a player in tight backhand shot, and that's just wide by Crapian, who was at the back door, unable to put it home. Ty Matthews able to clear the zone. Matthews thinking about a shorthanded chance here, shoots and scores! What a beautiful look just before the power play expired. Ty Matthews goes the length of the ice himself. And the freshman out of Auburn, Massachusetts, his third goal of the season. The Beacons' third shorthanded tally of the year. And it's 2-0 on what is a really tough turn of events for this post side. Had a power play, could have gained some momentum. Instead, Beacons able to get a goal with just mere seconds to go. I think there should have been about a second, second and a half to go before the power play expired. Right now, the power play says it's elapsed. The referees are still talking about it. If anything, I think you put a second back up. You put Carabelli back in the box, but you're not going to take this goal away. And the referees seem content. So it's 2-0. We're back to 5-on-5 five five hockey. Things couldn't get much better right now if you're a UMass Boston player or coach as they'll elect to dump this in post well. And... There's a big hit from Keegan behind the net. Puck comes right back at best, who will cover up before Engdahl can get there. Talk to head coach Peter Belisle before this tournament about generating energy, and he said the bench could easily do that without fans. Thus far, that hasn't been a problem, and a big part of that has been physicality. UMass Boston's trying to play physical this weekend as Walker and Engdahl will do it again. 62 seconds to go in the first period. UMass Boston leads it a pair of special teams goal. Won a power play goal, won a shorthanded tally. That bouncing puck ends up on the stick of Barter, but the Beacons are able to take it off his stick. And now Nicken will dump it out to the opposing blue line. Harrison Sheldon, the senior captain out of Marshfield, Mass tied up. 
Beacons looking potentially for one late chance with 40 seconds to go. Four Eagles, two Beacons, all trying to pry the puck loose. And eventually it's Nicken who comes up with it. Nick in for Walker. Puck stuck in his skates. Bounces out, and it's Walker to the blue to the slot, and it's Ethan Nicken, his second of the period. It's 3-0 UMass Boston. Nicken has goal number eight, his 30th of his career, and that is crushing if you're a post fan. The Beacons were just content to kind of skate into the zone, see if they could create anything. And Walker able to find Nicken for his second of the period. That was a little bit more difficult than the first one where he just jumps on a loose puck in the crease on the power play. Able to fire it top shelf over the shoulder of Brown. And it's 3-0 UMass Boston. Still 15 seconds to go here in the first period. The Beacons have now outscored the field here in the 56th annual Codfish Bowl. 8-0 through four periods and that will do it for the first period all UMass Boston a power play goal a shorthanded goal an even strength goal two goals in the final two plus minutes it is all UMass Boston through the first 20 minutes against the post University Eagles in the first ever meeting between these two sides so the Beacons get a pair of goals from Ethan Nicken and a shorty from Ty Matthews to take a 3-0 lead. Fans, stick with us for our intermission show. We'll have an interview with Gino Caravelli, a look at one of our conference championship winning teams here during the 2021 season and a look around the rest of Beaconville. First, let's take a look at our Beacon Spotlight with Gino Caravelli, who talks about how four years in the North American Hockey League prepared him both mentally and physically for the college level and what it was like last season not having games after playing 200 games over the previous four seasons. We'll hear from Gino right now. I was first introduced to hockey when I was a young kid. Uh, my parents put me on the ice and uh, for learning to skate and I was just doing snow angels out there when I was two years old. So not a whole lot of learning was going on, but a lot of fun was happening. And from there, uh, my older brother played. He was a big influence on me. so. He, had to follow in his footsteps a little bit and continue off of him. Playing hockey on the pond really takes you back to the roots of the game and where it all began. It was a lot of fun, obviously, going up, playing with my brothers. All, uh, all of my siblings play hockey, my sister included. My brother was a goalie, so we were able to take him out there and shoot on him when we could. But, um, no, it really brings back memories, especially being able to have practices on the pond and everything with the actual team. So it was pretty cool to experience and grow up in that type of a climate. Obviously it all depended. Michigan weather is crazy and uh, for those who live there know but I mean during the year, months of probably November to almost early February there was ice so that was always the best time of year. I was very fortunate enough to play four years in the all and 200 games. Um, couldn't have done it without my teammates, family and friends. Like A lot of support along the way. It was a lot of hard work but it let me to hear and really prepared me because it really is just grinding in the trenches and really doing everything you can to play every single game and going through the travel. It's like 60 games a season, so it's a lot different than what it is here, but it, it really does take a toll, but it really makes you a better player and a better person in the end. So I remember my first game there, I had a cage on and everything wasn't old enough to have a visor on. Um, I really come along, came a long way throughout that process. Through, like I said, my coaches, teammates helping me along the way, leading me. Like That's the biggest thing. Like. My peers helping me out and really led, leading me in the right direction. Like couldn't do it without them. And the teams I was on are always pretty successful and able to learn from like a winning team is huge. But also being able to learn how to lose and how to win is the biggest thing. Obviously, it's crazy. You're used to being on the ice like every single day and maybe get a two month break off. But even then, you're still skating the entire time. So it's weird to not even have ice to skate on. And it really, I mean, it was a setback. But we found a way to do everything we can to get together with all the guys. I mean. Healthy, our captain here, he really led the way and helped us all like get on the ice together. Coach Polly helped us out too. We went and skated at their academy, and that was the only ice available at the time. And we were lucky enough to be able to skate and stick together as a group. That was the biggest thing. Like we're all going through the same thing together. I mean, we're coming incoming freshmen, and they all took us under their wings and like really helped us. Like I said, like teammates really do help you out. Like especially the leaders, the the veterans, the upperclassmen. They really helped us out and really brought us in and made us feel like. A team. Well, definitely knowing the team and everybody, like getting to know everyone was huge. Like I said, 
being a part of the team is the biggest thing. That's the reason why we play. Yes, I mean, just to win, but it's to really build lifelong relationships with everybody and come together and win a championship. So being able to do that, work on little skills and stuff like that, even though we weren't playing actual games, uh, I felt was beneficial to a lot of us and to me especially. UMass Boston leads it 3-0 after 20 minutes. The Beacons open the scoring at 8.33. Ethan Nick in a power play goal. Ty Matthews and Devin Moran with the assist. The Ty Matthews goal at 18.43. Because the clock showed that the power play had ended, it's only going to go down as an even strength goal, even though it probably should have been a shorthanded tally. Either way, Matthews off to a great start with... A goal and an assist today after having a goal and assist yesterday. That was at 1843. Then at 1939, it was Ethan Nicken from Andy Walker and Jeffrey Skinner. Nicken's second goal, his 30th of his career. Walker, his fourth assist. Skinner, his fifth. Looking at the stats, all UMass Boston shots 19 to 5. Beacons 1 for 2 on the power play. Post 0 for 1. Sam Best with 5 saves, 16 saves on 19 shots for Brandon Brown as the Beacons thus far looking like they're on their way to their sixth ever Codfish Bowl title, but still a lot of time to go. Let's quickly look around the rest of the New England Hockey Conference. No games today, but there are a few games scheduled for Saturday that I believe are still on. At this point, it's you got to continuously check as having a little bit of a technical difficulty. Let's take a look at that uh, again. So these are the games scheduled for Saturday. SUNY Canton at Skidmore College at four. Fitchburg State at number five. Hobart College. Hamilton College travels to number eight. Norwich. Babson, who's also nationally ranked, I believe they're sixth, was supposed to take on Trinity. That game has been postponed. Honestly, games at this point are being postponed or canceled left and right here, not only in New England, all over the conference, all over the country because of COVID-19 and the latest variant, the Omicron variant. At this point, let's take a look back to easier times this past spring when the lacrosse team won their first ever Little East Conference Championship. It was a 14-13 championship victory over Westcon in one of two titles this calendar year for UMass Boston Athletics.
Fires a fresh shot. The Little East Conference Championship Tournament Most Outstanding Player Award is presented to UMass Boston's number eight, Junior Gavin Avery. Taking a look around the rest of Beaconville. Women's basketball was scheduled to go to Bowdoin College up in Brunswick, Maine this weekend for the Coastal Classic Tournament. They have been forced to pull out of this weekend's tournament, so they'll be back in action. It, we're expecting on Wednesday night at 5.30 against Castleton University in Little East Conference play. None of these contests you can guarantee will happen when they're supposed to, but... That's the current schedule. Uh, women's hockey at this point is scheduled to play on January 2nd at Amherst College and then on the 3rd at Middlebury College. A difficult start to the 2022 calendar year. Men's basketball will take part in that Little East Conference doubleheader on Wednesday at 7 p.m. and then track and field. They don't begin until Saturday, January 15th when they take on Brandeis. Let's move ahead and take a look ahead for UMass Boston. They still have four home games left in this season-high eight-game homestand, all in New England Hockey Conference play. Saturday or Friday, January 7th, they'll take on Skidmore College. The next day they're against Castleton University. Then they've got New England College on January 14th. And then a big one as they will host number eight, Norwich University. Four chances to pick up conference wins and a big three points in conference. They currently sit at three and two, tied for fourth in the 10 team conference, looking to add some big points before they head back on the road. Less than a minute to go before the start of the second period. We'll take an audio break and be back with you as UMass Boston leads post 3-0 through the first 20 minutes of the 56th annual Codfish Bowl Tournament Championship game. Second period about to get underway. The two sides switch sides. UMass Boston going from right to left. Post from left to right. Beacons gain possession and will dump it in. Comes all the way out and will be corralled there by Nolan Barrett who leaves it off, aiming to leave it off for Ethan Nicken. The Beacons have started each period with this second line and Nicken scored a goal, Yeah, or actually had an assist yesterday, has two goals today in this championship game. Leaves it off for Pat Keegan. Long stretch pass aiming for Andy Walker. And that pass is knocked down. Post finds themselves in a difficult spot. Already down three goals. So they need at least three to tie. Four to win. And managed just five shots in that first period. Puck bounces all the way around. Finds Jeffrey Skinner the near side. Tries to pass it across for Nicken. Went off of his skate and just wide as he looked for an early hat trick. Barrett trying to keep it in. Puck 
is knocked out to the neutral zone where Andy Walker collects, and it's Ethan Nickin who had that one go off of one of his own teammates and up into the Beacons bench. We'll see a faceoff coming just outside of the UMass Boston zone. They're actually going to push this one out to center ice. It'll be Lapworth and Matthews. Matthews has a goal and assist in both games of this tournament thus far. Could be one of the front runners for a potential tournament MVP. Krupinski across for Roland, and he finds the tape of Matthews, who couldn't quite hold on. UMass Boston, through their first four periods of this tournament, have allowed just 16 shots. Sam Best has stopped all 16 he's faced. Matthews into the zone, loses it as he tried to get to the slot. That one gets just past Krupinski, and Moran, who's covering for Krupinski, gives it up, but comes back, and nice little poke check there from the Beacons freshman out of Lemonster, Massachusetts. Moran back with it here into the zone. Moran at the slot, shoots, and Brandon Brown the save. Minute 45 gone by in the first period. Bordeaux will take this face off against John Crapian. Top line out there for Post trying to get something going. Evan Helt, the catch right at the red line, and he'll play it back for Joe Petrozella. Stretch pass catches Bordeaux's stick on the way in, and we'll get another offensive zone draw for the Beacons. Neither of these games will count towards a potential at-large bid for UMass Boston. In fact, yesterday's game won't even count for their season statistics against the club side. So it was an exhibition game, but certainly good for UMass Boston to get a little bit bit of momentum and potentially rack up another codfish ball title if they can hang on here over the next 40 minutes this team had a difficult game against Plymouth State their last time out on December the 7th a 4-1 loss to a nationally ranked side in which it was 2-1 until Plymouth got two late empty net goals you'd like to get some confidence heading into that stretch to begin 2022 when they'll play four straight conference games the Beacons still very much are in the midst of the NEHC regular season title hunt. One of the toughest conferences in the country, and right now they're in the low 20s in the pairwise, can easily work themselves back as the wraparound chance. Instead of shooting it there, Dakota Concadon wisely kept control of the puck as Brandon Brown had lost his stick. Behind the net, it's Duncan trying to hold off DeLore. He's got Bordeaux to his right, who was tangled up with the other player there that was Patrick Murphy and finally it'll go up into the rafters on that attempted clearance and we'll get an offensive zone draw should get an offensive zone draw and it will stay in the zone Beacons will take the fourth line and for Peter Whitney he's going to go with line number three Bankowskis wins it back for Atkins. Shot from Barrett. Didn't get much behind it. Brown the save. Puck is poked over to the far side where Keegan collects. Keegan will dump it down low. Carabelli comes over, but it's poked loose by Karras. Out of the zone now. And broken up there as Engdahl had his pocket picked. Barrett looking at his options. Will just lay it off looking for Carabelli who gets... Tangled up there with John Archevsky, and it'll go back into the Beacon zone. 3.40 gone by in the second period. It was 3-0 after one. Here's a rare chance for Post, but unable to get a shot off was Michael Karras there as it looked like he might get a look off from the high slot. Keegan tries to pull up, takes a hit that knocks him to his knees. Beacons on the breakout, Adkins with it, gains the zone, has his initial shot knocked down, Brown, Brown couldn't find the rebound as it kind of sat on the top of his shoulder, finally gets it cleared, here's Carabelli poking it down low with Bankowskis centering it, Carabelli nearly was able to control it, instead we'll go the other way with Karras once again, Karras the top line defenseman chasing it all the way below the goal line, 
He'll get some help up top from Tommy Boyce. Nolan Arbuckle for Boyce, who whiffs on the shot there, and then he's tripped up by Nickin. No call. Post making a change on the fly here as they've got some rare zone time. Turnaround shot just wide there from Nico Grohlman. Post hasn't had many looks from a spot that close to the net today. Fourth line is struggling to get it out of the zone right now for UMass Boston. It's rolling, tries to dish it over for Bankowski. It's noticeably tired legs right now for this unit. And finally, Barrett will pick it up. Bankowskis will slowly get off. And the rest of that group will as well, as it's now the Beacon second line. Long stretch pass for Walker out of his reach, all the way in on Brown. And the Beacon's fortunate to get an offensive zone draw there as Barrett nearly found Walker in behind the defense. Walker, Nickin, Skinner, Osborne, and Krupinski. For Post, they'll bring out the top line of Gardner, Crapian, and Murphy. Walker versus Crapian, and another whistle. Peter Belial right now is talking to, I think it's Roland and Barrett, about something that was going on in the defensive zone there. Has those two off to the side while the play goes on. Face-off win for Post. Going the other way with it is Murphy. Gets around Osborne there and then takes a heavy hit into the boards. Skinner clears it right to the skate there of Nickin, who has a pair of goals thus far, including what currently would stand up as the game winner. Skinner dispossesses an eagle of the puck. Will dump it down low with Walker and Nickin giving chase. First player to it is Arbuckle. One of eight players on this post roster out of the state of Massachusetts. Skinner off the boards looking for Nick in the Miami Beach, Florida native. So we're just under 14 minutes to go in the second stanza. Here's Osborne with it. Osborne shot from distance. Easy save for Brown and he'll hold on. Another offensive zone draw for the Beacons. In the first period, UMass Boston held a slight 12-11 edge in the faceoff. Dot would like to do a little bit better here in the second. We'll see Matthews face off against Lapworth and another face off win for Post. They're doing a better job, especially in their own zone. Petrozella pushes it out for Moran, who's got an assist today. Right back for Joe. Petrozella gains the zone. It's an NEHC all rookie team selection as a freshman back in 2019 20. Evan Helt pinches forward, able to keep the puck alive. Gets help coming back from Devin Moran. Moran still with it. Puck was pulled loose, but ended up on the stick of Matthews there for a second. And now Post able to clear as far as the Beacons blue line. Matthews dumps it off for Peters, who had a pair of assists yesterday. Doesn't have anything today. Shot from Helt and another glove save from Brown. Peters, the Beacons' leading point scorer this season, but hasn't had to do too much this midweek. Codfish Ball Tournament played on Wednesday and Thursday this year, the 29th and 30th of December. It used to be played in the new year, but they've pushed this tournament up, especially this season because of where New Year's falls. Got conference play next weekend, so didn't want to have a couple games early in the week and then two games that counted a little bit more in the regular season standings. Right? Tape to tape pass for Keegan here, who has two options to his right. Tried to find Bordeaux there, but it was broken up nicely by Archevsky. Into the zone. Here's a chance for Engdahl, but another save for Best, who hasn't had to do too much work, but has been able to stand up to the task for the test when called upon. Beacons pick up the fluttering puck. It's Con Cannon over for Duncan. Duncan leaves it for Bordeaux, who got very little behind that one-timer. Able to break up the play there, though. Con Cannon in a tight space for Duncan, who tried to get it in there in a very tight area. As Duncan took a big hit, slap shot from Barrett, and it's 4-0. 
Nolan Barrett his second goal of the weekend and that was emphatic as he teed it up and fired a missile past Brown and it is 4-0 UMass Boston and that was a beaut. Second collegiate goal that will count in the statistics for Nolan Barrett, the freshman of Wayne, New Jersey, and that was just gorgeous to watch. Off the ensuing faceoff, the Beacons immediately send it into the zone shot from distance, and Brown able to make this save on the look from Adkins. UMass Boston has been going to this fourth line a lot after goals. Sorry, the fourth goal they've scored. Clearly a lot of confidence in this group. And why not? This is a team that goes so deep that Peter Belisle doesn't really have any players that you kind of want to hide on the fourth line. It's more, he's got five or maybe even five and a half lines of forwards that he's really confident in. Alex Duncan is credited with the assist on the goal from Barrett. That'll be his fourth of the season. 4-0 UMass Boston as we reach the midway point of this 56th annual Codfish Bowl tournament. Duncan was the guy who took the, the big heavy hit behind the goal, but it was able to get back up, and the Beacon scored shortly afterwards. Wraparound chance there. That effort coming from Carabelli, who scored a pair of goals in a win over Southern Maine in his first collegiate home game as the Beacons started on the road for their first six. And we've got an offside coming against Post here with 11 minutes to go in the second period. Crapian wins the faceoff against Walker. If you're post, the one positive is they've been much better in the faceoffs here in the second period than they were in the first. Lost a lot of offensive zone draws as the shot from Helt is held on to by Brown. Held immediately threw his head up in the air. Still looking for collegiate goal number one, the grad student captain out of Sylvania, Ohio. 56th collegiate game. Nine assists, no goals. Reaching that Andrew Crawford territory where, to Andrew Crawford's credit, it took him almost his entire collegiate career, and then he scored two goals in his many playoff games during the Beacons' first ever New England Hockey Conference championship run and their first NCAA tournament run. The shot gets knocked down, and Best will have to play it there with Helt right in front of him. Can Post mount some kind of comeback here, or is this going to be all UMass Boston all week long? Already outscored their two opponents 9-0. It's the long stretch pass aiming for Nick and is deflected. Brown will come out of his net to play it and does a nice job there. It's knocked down by Walker and eventually picked up by Ryan Mosier. We'll get a whistle and a faceoff coming just outside the Post zone as that puck got deflected up and out. This is a post team that sits at 4-5 and five on the year, 3-2 and two in Northeast 10 play. Picked 7th out of 7 teams out of finish, after finishing 7th out of 7 in their first year in the NE10 back in 2019-20 when they won just one game. This year, though, 3-2 and two off to a much better start, including a win over Franklin Pierce, who they were supposed to play yesterday before Franklin Pierce pulled out at almost the last possible minute, just two and a half hours before their scheduled 4 o'clock start time. We're wishing everyone in the Franklin Pierce hockey program the best as they go through some stuff in their program just as so many teams are doing at this point. Not only 
in Division Three and Division Two, or in or in hockey. Just here it is. Here's a great chance going the other way. Is Boyce one on one with Best and a huge save from Best who holds his post. Easily the best save from Sam Best this weekend on a great effort from Tommy Boyce looking for his second goal of the season and. When things are going your way, they really are going your way. Not only has the offense been working for UMass Boston, the defense has been good almost all weekend long. A rare miscue by the Beacons defense. And in this case, Sam Best holds up and holds on to his post there, able to deny Tommy Boyce what would have been a huge first goal for post and a huge first goal for an opponent against UMass Boston. Best looks for his first shutout of the season that will count officially. Played the full 60 yesterday and made 11 saves. The referees are talking right here. There was a bit of pushing and shoving after the play. It did appear like Nolan Barrett might have been poked in the, the nether regions as he went down hard behind the goal. And now the two referees are joined by one of the linesmen. And let's see what the referee's gonna call here. I think we're gonna see a penalty. Yeah, it, it did appear as if Barrett took a, a stick to a place you don't wanna take one. And we're gonna see Chase Lapworth go to the box for two. We'll wait on the official call, but that's what I saw after the play. And the Beacons will get their third power play of the day, already leading four nothing directly after the best chance of the day for post. This is adding insult to injury right now if you're the Eagles as Peter Whitney gets the explanation from either Alex Germany-Wald or Jeff McCorkle. That was Jeff McCorkle and the Beacons will get a chance to tack on another power play goal. One for two thus far. Top unit out there. This is the group that scored the first power play goal. It was Nick in from Matthews and Moran. Another face-off win for Post. It'll be Jake Raleigh. It's going to be a slashing penalty on Chase Lapworth. As Moran able to gain the zone. Lost possession, but Matthews was there to pick it up. Peters from the circle. Glove save from Brown. Couldn't hold on, and it's Collected by Moran below the goal line. Matthews far side for Peters. Right back for Barrett. Already has one slap shot goal. Doesn't get much behind him. The Beacons keeping it alive. Pinching forward is Matthews. Can't quite get there. And a good clearance coming from Jake Raleigh. Still a minute 18 to go on the man advantage. As Post will get another four skaters out there. Beacons can't handle the pass. That was Peters who couldn't quite collect it. And now with a minute eight to go. Beacons will look to get another zone entry. Peters goes high off the boards. That one nearly came out behind the net. This one will take an awkward bounce, awkward carom, and allow Post to not only come out of the zone, but maybe a little bit more. Puck is poked loose for Boyce, who just had that great chance. Forces the kick save from Best. This has been much better from Post on the penalty kill. Puck comes loose again. Boyce was looking for a second one-on-one -on -one chance with Sam Best. Instead, the Beacons fluttered in for Duncan, who forces the kick save. Puck stays in the zone for a moment. Now we're going to get a whistle and a face-off just outside the zone with 27 seconds to go on the man advantage. 7.37 to go in the period. Walker wins the faceoff clean there against Ryan Mosier. Krupinski dishes it off for Skinner, dangles his way through, looking for Walker there. Might have had a shot if he was a little bit more selfish. And it'll be clear the length of the ice again with 10 seconds to go. So it looks like this should be a, a good kill from a pretty good penalty killing unit. And there's another turnover, Connor Barter one-on-one. -on -one. Barter goes again, looking to that near post. And again, Best holds on for dear life. Two huge saves here in the second period to keep this game at four nothing. And there's a shot from distance that Best makes the save. This is the most work that he's put in all week long. And 
showing why he was the guy the Beacons turned to as the shot from Skinner catches the side netting there. Again, Connor Mc, McAnima, McNanima, excuse me, the Beacons sophomore goalie who's been splitting time this year with Best and had started the previous two games unavailable. A Skinner's one-timer is saved by Brown. And he's taken out by Connor Barter. McAnima unavailable for this Codfish Bowl tournament. Best filling in and playing well through the first almost 100 minutes. Let's go 94-29 if my math is right. He has been perfect. Actually, 93-29. He has been perfect. Matt Meisenbacher, our typical color commentator, was with me. He would hit me in the head and tell me this is the ultimate goaltender curse. But the way Best is playing, even if he gives up a goal, I think the Beacons would be fully behind him. With those two huge saves, first on Boyce, then on Barter, to keep this game at 4-0. Two huge saves, one-on-one -on -one with the no defenseman back. So there's another save from Brown, who's been good today. Very little he could do on most of the goals. First from Ethan Nick in a power play goal where he made the initial save, couldn't find the rebound, and Nick and poked it in. Then Ty Matthews undressed the pair of defensemen and is able to beat him basically in that same spot that Best has made two huge saves on with the player coming in one-on-one -on -one with the goalie. Then it was Nick in a high shot from the low slot late in the first period to make it 3-0, and Nolan Barrett on leashing a huge slap shot in this period to make it 4-0. Post trying to grab some momentum with 5.52 to go in the second period. They were thinking they were going to play twice this week, hoping to play for a championship. Yesterday's game canceled while they were still on the bus as two players go hard into the boards, and it looks like the Beacon player, Carabelli, might be even in more pain than the post player who is already going down. That's Nick Brewer, but both players in a ton of pain, and it does appear as if Gino's going to need to be attended to by UMass Boston trainer Ed Perkins. So both trainers coming out, although Brewer is able to skate off with very limited help. Carabelli. Moving a little bit, we're going to take an audio break and we will be back in just a moment as Gino Carabelli's up to his knees and that's definitely a good sign. 5.35 to go in the second period, UMass Boston leads it 4-0. Gino Carabelli able to skate off and is currently off the bench right now being attended to by the Beacons trainer and the Beacons on-call doctor. Hopefully Gino is okay. The battle behind the net is won by UMass Boston's Michael Krupinski. Over for Con Cannon and now it's Bordeaux who will flip it into the zone. Puck. Bouncing around, Bordeaux trying to keep it in as he battles with Raleigh, and eventually it'll be picked up by Delory for post. Delory will dump it in and give chase. Keegan is there first, took a little bit of an odd carom. Bordeaux tries to poke it out of the zone. Shot flutters well wide of the net. 4.45 to go, and what has been a physical contest? That puck makes it all the way through the Raptors with no contact. Krupinski will bump it back into the neutral zone, and we've got an offside on post. Four thirty-two to go as UMass Boston looks. Four thirty-two to go in the second period, as the Beacons look for their first Codfish Bowl title since 2014 in their 
sixth ever Cod Fish Bowl Championship. Post wins another faceoff. They've been really strong in the faceoff here in the second period. That time it was Patrick Murphy, and Murphy is badgering the Beacons in their own zone as they try to break out. Walker's pass is intercepted there by Karras. Shot from distance, easily stopped by Best. Just out of the reach there of a post player as Nicken took a fall right at the blue line. Here's a shot from distance, knocked down by a post player, and it'll be into the post bench, and another face-off coming this time inside the zone. Beacon's top line against the fourth line for post. Lapworth, Sturgeon, and Mosier against Matthews, Moran, and Peters. Face-off controlled by the Eagles, and that shot tipped up a little bit too high there by Engdahl, who's out there with Lapworth and Barter. So the lines have really been mixed in match right now by Peter Whitney. Lapworth again able to win it, but it's pushed out of the zone this time by Engdahl. And we're going to get another face-off. And while there are no fans in the stands, there are a couple of scratches. And the one scratch for Post that's in the stands nearly was hit by that puck in the head. Fortunately able to get out of the way. But even with less than 10 people in the stands between the two sides, still could find a onlooker in a little bit of danger. Beacons have to touch up here. They do as Moran gets knocked down in the neutral zone. UMass Boston will dump it in behind the cage of Brown, who's been good today despite giving up the four goals. Lapworth on a two-on-two -two opportunity with Engdahl, but it's broken up nicely by Petrozella. Back out to the blue line for Sheldon, whose shot is tipped up into the netting. We've got another stoppage. Feels like we're getting whistles every 15 to 20 seconds at this point. Rollman loses that draw to Walker, but it's collected there nicely by Raleigh and Best forced to make another save. And yet another whistle. Really does feel like this end of the second period is dragging a bit as Post making an effort to get back into this game any way they can. Shot from distance and another easy save. This time Archevsky with no kind of traffic in front and we might be setting a record for the slowest minute of hockey without a penalty I think I've ever seen. This might be our fourth whistle in the last 12 seconds. Offensive zone draw coming. It'll be Grohlman working against Bankowskis, who is a go-to faceoff taker for the Beacons. See if he can win one, and he does. Big time win for the Beacons just to get it out of the zone. Got to do that first as Duncan pushes it back behind the net for Barrett. Now it's Keegan off the back of the skate there of Duncan, but Keegan able to collect it. And it's broken up just shy of the zone. Duncan will dump it into the zone as we're finally below the three-minute mark. First time that we've played more than 20 consecutive seconds in quite a while. Ships to the Beacons blue line where it's broken up. Neither team has been able to really establish a ton of zone time. The Beacons had all kinds of zone time in the first period, but have struggled to find consistency here in the second. Duncan for Bankowskis, broken up by Karras. Out top, it's Barry who has the fourth of the Beacons four goals. Keegan's shot comes right back at him, and now he's in a foot race against Murphy. Keegan loses his stick. Murphy has reinforcements coming. Shot from distance just wide from Archevsky. And now the Beacons have a two-on-one opportunity. Walker with Barrett and the trailer is nicking. Walker takes it himself. Brown the save and he holds on.
Minute 55 to go. A rare, really good chance for the Beacons after they dominated the first, I'd say, period and a half. I've been able to get as much going here over the past 10 minutes. Walker and the Beacon second line will stay out there, working against the top line for post of Crapian. Well, it looks like they've changed that top line as well. It looks like Crapian, Mosier, and Raleigh. Shot from Skinner on the turnaround, just a bit wide of that far post. Bouncing puck, Skinner pushes it over for Nickett. No luck feed, right to the tape of a post player. And it'll come all the way down the length of the ice. Not enough speed to get an icing there. We've hit the 90-second mark to go in the second period. Beacons let it 3-0 after one. Lone goal in the second came from Nolan Barrett, but the bigger highlights were the two huge saves from Sam Best on one-on-one -on -one opportunities. It's the Beacons defense gave up a couple of Pretty good looks, and Best was able to stand up to the task. We've got an icing against Post. Top line out there, Matthews, Moran, and Peters. That same group for Post, who at least has Crapian centering, who was the center on the top line. Crapian able to win it over for Delory there, puck comes loose the shot from Matthews and coming off of his goal line there was Brown to deny Matthews what would have been his second of the day and third of the week 101 to go in this 56th annual Codfish Bowl tournament championship game here in the second period all beacons thus far outscored the URI club team 5-0 yesterday leading it 4-0 here Karras on the outlet pass for Barter. Barter dumps it in. And it's Petrozello with it. For Peters. Lapworth couldn't quite hold on, and it's cleared out as far as Arbuckle. Arbuckle floats one in just wide of best, and Evan Helt will look to start the breakout. Long stretch pass, able to find Peters. Peters. Dips it off for Petrozella, just out of the reach of Moran. Matthews holds on to the zone and keeps the puck in there for a moment. Big hit coming as Held able to knock Barter down hip to hip. And all that noise is coming from the Beacons bench as they celebrate the contacts from Held. One last chance here with three seconds to go, and that will do it. UMass Boston tacks on a fourth goal from Nolan Barrett, his second collegiate tally. And the Beacons able to keep the shutout going thanks to the very strong play from Sam Best. It's 4-0 after two periods. The Beacons 20 minutes away potentially from their sixth and from their sixth ever Codfish Bowl title. It's right now couple of the both post coaches are screaming at the referees asking why there wasn't a penalty there late right now we're going to take a chance to hear from another beacons player this time it's owen bordeaux very talented sophomore out of saginaw michigan had high hopes for his last seasons of junior hockey but a Torn ACL not only ended his season, but potentially could have ended his pursuit of playing college hockey. He talks about having to mentally and physically overcome his torn ACL, what it meant to get the call from UMass Boston, and how COVID actually maybe benefited him in his return to hockey as Bordeaux back in the lineup today. Two goals, four assists, and six points through his first 11 collegiate games. At the beginning of the year, I had a goal to, I mean, commit to play college hockey, which is, I mean, everyone's junior goal. And then it started out hot, like I was playing good. I was getting good scoring chances, making plays with my teammates. And then ha about halfway through, I tore my ACL. And, I mean, it, it just ruined my season, So, which was brutal. But, 
I mean, I just pushed through it. First thought was it's it, nothing bad happened. And then you go to the doctors and you figure out everything and you're like, this is not good. But then you just go through everything. You go through physical therapy and all that. And then you just try and get stay positive through it all and then come back just better and stronger. The time period with it was it was about nine months from surgery and then you slowly start doing things with your leg and then it just gets more increasingly like harder more strain on it and then just eventually it's fixed and everything's good to go and that's what I went through like that's how I went through it and it's been good ever since. After the fact that I tore it um, I didn't hear anything from coaches before it I was talking to schools going on college visits but after it I had nothing come through but I have always had good coaches around me and they got me calls with schools like later on in the year late summer I got a call from coach Belisle and thought this was the school for me and have loved it ever since it was really good to hear from coaches to get calls and be able to like think I can play again and not knowing for sure um, but then I got calls and then it just made me push even harder to come back stronger and like on my knee and everything but it just it was very positive to hear from coaches that saw what I could do and heard what I can do through coaches and then were willing to give me a chance it was tough at first I mean you always want to play games and get back into it but I mean like I've been saying it's a positive for me I was hurt all that last year I could take it slow um, and just meeting all the guys I was able to get close with them the whole time and now like I do anything with all of them they're they're a great time to be around they're good guys it's just a fun group to be around being that it was my first game I was just trying to come in and make an impression for coach and I mean I ended up getting a goal in the first period and then they just kept coming my way. I, I mean, I was pumped to get three goals in one game. I mean, it's tough enough to even get one or even an assist or even to play good, but to get three in one game was just awesome to come back to. And I was, was like, it was awesome. It was just really cool to be a part of, and we got the win. It was fun. Yeah, it was actually not until, I mean, I was excited to get the hat trick, but not until after the game. I talked to family from home. I got to FaceTime them, and they were all pumped. They watched the game. They were at my cousin's house. They had 20 people there, and just getting a call from them to see how excited they were to see me play again was just unreal. I was super happy to see that. Nine forty nine to go before the start of the third period. You see the statistics through two periods. UMass Boston leading in shots thirty eight to seventeen, doubling up the post university Eagles. Sam Best now with twenty eight saves over the first five periods of this tournament. A sneaky dark horse MVP candidate in the fifty sixth annual Cotfish Bowl tournament. Brandon Brown, the senior, has been good. Thirty four saves on thirty eight shots, sixteen saves in the first period, eighteen more in the second. Deacons are 1 for 3 on the power play. Post is 0 for 1. The scoring summary, well, Ethan Nickin scored a power play goal at 8.33 with Ty Matthews and Devin Moran.
picking up assists. Ty Matthews scored what should have been a shorthanded goal, but ended just before or just after the power play ended. So he made it 2-0 at 1843 of the first. At 1939, it was Nickin from Walker and Skinner. And the long goal in the second period was Nolan Barrett, an even strength goal from Owen Bordeaux and Alex Duncan. No other games going on today in New England Hockey Conference play, but a couple other games scheduled for this week. SUNY Canton is at Skidmore College on New Year's Day. Fitchburg State is at Hobart. Hamilton is at Norwich. So NEHC teams all hosting this week, at least on the men's side. Right now, while we've got a moment, let's take a look at another Little East Conference Championship victory. This time it's from the fall as the UMass Boston volleyball team came back to earn a 3-2 Little East Conference Championship win over Eastern Connecticut State just a few months ago. If you are what you say you are a superstar, then have no fear. The camera's here and the microphone's on the wall. Oh, 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 oh. If you are what you say you are a superstar. If 
20 minutes on the clock before we will crown a Codfish Bowl champ. UMass Boston leads it 4-0. They've outscored their two opponents this week, 9-0 overall. Uh, Sam Best has been able to stop all 28 shots he's faced for post. An uphill battle here in the third. They need four. Thus far this season, when scoring two goals or less, they are 0-5, trying to avoid an 0-6 mark is the shot from Skinner. Another glove save for Brown, who's up to 35 of them now through two-plus periods. Andy Walker in the faceoff dot against Nico Grohlman. We've really seen Post go more and more with just two lines, and it's not the same two lines it's mixing and matching I haven't seen much of Kieran Gardner who was listed as the top line left wing I haven't seen much out of Casey Sturgeon either he has played but so they've really been mixing and matching 10 forwards against two or three lines the Beacons 
have started with this second line in all three periods, and they've done well. Ethan Nickin has two of the Beacons' four goals. Coming out of the locker room late is Alex Duncan and Gino Carabelli, which is a good sign. Carabelli took a heavy hit into the boards late in that second period, was being attended to by the Beacons' doctor, and it looks like both guys are headed to the bench, so good sign. Hate to pick up an injury, especially anything significant in a holiday tournament like this with conference play right around the corner. Matthews versus Grohlman in the faceoff, and Grohlman wins another one. One area that Post has had the upper hand is in the faceoffs. 27 of 52 through the first two periods. And in that second period, they were plus four. Beacons leave the puck, and Gardner almost had a great opportunity. His shot didn't really put any pressure on Sam Best, but no one was there to pick it up. Now it's Matthews with it for UMass Boston. Matthews turns, tries to create some space, was looking for Petrozell. Turnaround shot from Peters is stopped by Brown. Peter is still with it, has it poked away by Gardner, who, just as I say, we haven't seen much out of the sophomore out of Ashburn, Virginia. He gets his shift here early on in the third period. Rolling the long stretch pass, looking for Peters. I don't think it caught any bit of his stick, and it'll be an icing call against the Beacons with 18-18 to go in regulation. Certainly an odd field to play a hockey game, much less a championship game, with nobody in the stands. Beacons have four or five scratches. Post has one. That's all the fans in attendance for this game. Those guys aren't fans in any way. They, We saw a couple of them play for UMass Boston yesterday, but it, it's hockey back to its simplest form just people playing to have fun and obviously win Seventeen fifty four to go as Sam Best skates out of his net over to the near boards and back saw him do that quite a few times yesterday just trying to stay engaged in this contest which just like yesterday, he hasn't had to do all that much work, although the second period, Post was able to challenge him a couple times. A pair of breakaways that he was able to hold on to the near post and make kick saves. Here's a chance into the zone. It's Delory, rather Raleigh, 37, not 27. Raleigh will leave it off, comes all the way behind the net where it's picked up by Krupinski, who can't hold on. Grohlman on the turnaround has it knocked away by Krupinski. It's Keegan who loses an edge. Boyce will chip it towards the net. Puck is loose, and Concanon dives to try to poke it out of the zone, unable to do so. Krupinski now right to the tape of Concanon. Concanon still with it. Dakota takes a shot that goes just wide of the near post. Pinching forward and keeping the puck in the zone is Evan Helt just off the bench. Big hit from Dakota Con Cannon on the smaller Harrison Sheldon. Love the physicality we've seen from UMass Boston as Bankowskis is going to be whistled for the high stick. And we'll see a face-off in the zone. Shot attempts now are 55-24 in favor of UMass Boston. Chance up top, Karras, the glove save from Best. As Sam Best, the Beacons junior goalie out of Woburn, Mass, who began his collegiate career at Division I American International College, looks to hold on for the tournament shutout. Already had one yesterday, and again, it won't count for his stats, but will for his confidence. Looking for 
his first official shutout of the season. So the drop pass comes all the way out of the zone off the stick of Gardner. Atkins with Bankowskis rushing towards the net just underneath his stick. Bankowskis goes hard into the post. Got a whistle to check on Mankowskis and potentially a hooking penalty on the Eagles. We'll see as Coley's going to limp his way over to the bench. Doesn't need help. Peter Belisle is certainly begging for a potential penalty here. And instead, we're going to see a faceoff outside the zone as the Beacons were guilty of taking the net off its moorings. Matthews wins the faceoff forward for Peters. Takes a hit from Arbuckle, but continues chasing it. Working against a pair of Eagles. Puck comes loose in the circle. Matthews knocks it down in the slot. Near side for Petrozella. Petrozella will chase it along the far side. Working against Arbuckle there. And the puck will be knocked down. Petrozella couldn't quite keep it in. Going the other way with it. It's Barter dishing it off. He was able to find Mosier there for a shot that went well wide. Peters to the skates of Moran. It looks like Matthews may have gone a bit early, but no call from the linesman there. Matthews tried to tie up Lapworth. It was picked up by Mosier. Out ahead, it's Barter here right into the crease and doesn't get a shot off or near, nor a penalty. He was tied up with the beacon. Matthews trying to go 1v3. He's already undressed a couple defensemen on his first goal, but nothing coming there. Five minutes gone by in this third period. We're scoreless in the third. Beacon scored three in the first, one more in the second to take this 4-0 lead as they've outscored their two opponents, the URI club team and post university 9 nothing on the weekend as that one's out of the reach of Nickin and we'll get another icing call against the Beacons not the strongest codfish bowl field that we've seen in recent years big part of that was a couple teams had to drop out the Beacons were supposed to host Curry College Suffolk University and Wentworth Institute of Technology all out of the Commonwealth Coast Conference. But those three schools found out in late in the spring that they were going to have to play more conference games than they originally expected this season as the stretch pass for Nick and Nick and trying for a shot. Puck comes all the way through the crease without anyone touching it and it's finally picked up by Post. Those three schools found out they needed these two games for conference play so they had to adjust their schedule. And Peter Belial, Rhode Island native. It's Skinner here trying to dish it off for Nick, and he's tripped up. He'll draw the penalty, and the shot from Keegan is picked up by Brown. UMass Boston will go on the power play for a fourth time. But head coach Peter Belial was good friends with Joe Augustine, the URI club coach, so... Those two teams have been trying to play for a while, invited the URI club team to this tournament. And then both Franklin Pierce and Post needed some games on their schedule. We're going to see a penalty against Post. It looks like it will be Trey DeLore. It's guilty of the trip. Beacons, I think, are claiming there maybe should be a penalty shot. That's the delay, although now Nicken might be heading off as well. This could be a four-on-four, four and it will be. And I don't know what it could be unless they're potentially calling an embellishment. So four-on-four four we, we go. Matthews, Moran, Petrozella, and Roland against Lapworth, Lapworth, Engdahl, Karras, and Archevsky. So the penalty was Delory for tripping, and they do get Nick in for embellishment there, which, or rather was a hooking call on Delory. 
love to have replay. Unfortunately, with a lack of student workers during the holidays, plus fears over the COVID-19 variant Omicron, don't have access to our full webcasting setup. Four on four, we skate right now. It's Raleigh all the way to the slot. Best makes the chest save. Puck still loose and a good clearance there by Roland. He gets it out to the far boards. Roland pushes it around for Petrozella all the way for Moran, who's immediately met by Arbuckle. And now both players end up on their butts. Petrozella trying to get around Arbuckle. Instead, he'll just lift it and dump it in. 41 to go on the four on four. Peters centers it, and Brown will knock it down with the stick and hold on. Peters was trying to find Nolan Barrett. 12.53 to go in regulation. 37 seconds on the four on four. Matching penalties to DeLorean Nickin. Peters wins it out for Helt. Helt shot. Blocker save there from Brown, who has been good. I mean, UMass Boston has scored nine goals this weekend, but it's felt like it could have been more. Nico Grohlman will skate with a little bit of pace into the beacon zone with 18 to go on the man advantage. Held able to clean it up for Barrett and right back for Helt. Those two join out there with Osborne and Peters. The Beacons right now with three defensemen out there, but that shows how much confidence they have in Barrett, who's one of the best offensive defensemen the Beacons have had in the last five years. Just a freshman away in New Jersey. Back to five on five play, and it'll be Gardner off the bench, our post player to watch. It's tipped by a Beacon stick and just wide. I think that was Helt who got the deflection. Puck still loose and unable to clear it. Finally comes off the mass there of Peters. Nicken gets knocked down from a knee. Will dump it in and Barrett's going to give chase. As Barrett is very clearly playing forward right now. I don't know if that's an adjustment because of numbers or if that's just because of where he was in the four on four. As it's collected by Brown will get a whistle and let's see if the Beacons will make any adjustments. Barrett's looking to the bench, asking, hey, am I coming on? Am I staying off? Or am I staying on as a defenseman, as a forward? And he will come off. He gets back to a more normal three forwards and two defensemen as the shot from Nickin is deflected out in front as he still looks for that elusive third goal. Engdahl able to knock it out of the zone. Nicken giving chase, working there against Delory. Backdoor pass and an easy goal for Owen Bordeaux. Dakota Concanon set him up nicely. Brown was way out of position, and Concanon scores his second collegiate goal. Bordeaux, his second assist on the day, and the weekends have made it 5-0 for the second consecutive day. Bordeaux unavailable yesterday, back today. Two assists on the day. Con Cannon becomes the fourth different goal scorer for the Beacons today. They had five goal scorers in yesterday's contest. As we are nearly at the midway point of this third period, and it just looks more and more like the Beacons are going to cruise to what would be their sixth ever Codfish Bowl championship victory. Bankowskis leaves it off, shot from Skinner, a blocker save with the player right in front of him. Good work from Brandon Brown, who this loss is not gonna be on him. He is easily gonna make 40, if not 50 saves. Skinner looking for a shot, kick save from Brown. Puck is finally dealt with there by Trey DeLore. Pushed ahead, but only as far as Petrozella. Now Gardner will dish it off. Seen a lot of orange jerseys on the ice as the Beacons have really been physical today against this post team playing their first game in three weeks. 
Bankowskis gains the red line. Bankowskis will elect to dump it in and he'll head off. Only half showing off his speed that time. Got a whistle and I think it's going to be Chris Peters with a, a slash behind the play. Nope, we're going to see a high stick as Peters took a slash to the helmet there. And the Beacons will head back to the power play now for the fourth time. Thought they earned one earlier, but they called the embellishment and a matching penalty against Nickin. It will be the second unit. Bordeaux, Skinner, Petrozella, Walker, and Krupinski here to start with 9.51 to go. Beacons looking to add a second power play goal on the day, third of the week. Skinner for Krupinski, who has his shot deflected wide by Bordeaux. Walker behind the net. Near side for Skinner. Skinner will dish it off for Krupinski. One text into another. Back up top, it's Jeffrey Skinner. Over to the far side for Petrozella. Petrozella's shot saved by Brown. And he can't collect the rebound. It'll allow Boyce to clear at the length of the ice all the way in on best. And he will hold on to it until he gets Krupinski behind the net. Andy Walker, one of the two men in blades, the two beacons who traveled nearly 1,000 miles on rollerblades last summer to raise money for the American Cancer Society. He and Jake Atkins. Right before break, the Beacons hosted a Hockey Fights Cancer game and raised more money for the American Cancer Society. Top unit out there now for the Beacons. Moran, Barrett, Nickin, Peters as Barrett shoots and scores. His second of the day, third in two games. He took that one all the way into the zone and a nice little wrister. His second power play goal of the week. And it's now 6-0 Beacons. Off the ensuing faceoff. UMass Boston will collect it. It's Heltz who will pop it up in behind the net. Beacons look to close this one out at this point. You'd love another goal or two potentially. The big thing is you would avoid any injuries. And you'd love to hold on to this shutout for Sam Best who came up big in that Second period with a couple of saves on breakaway chances for the Eagles. Turnaround shot comes all the way out. Miscommunication there between Helt and Bankowskitz. Puck comes loose right at center right. It's Matthews with Peters to his right. His pass just a bit too strong. Peters will follow up working against Karras. Gets some help from Matthews. Far side Moran all the way out up top. Slap shot from Keegan. A howitzer that goes just high. And Krupinski plays that one with the high stick. Pretty obvious. And the referee is going to say play on. That stick was well above the head of a player. Now Matthews just wide and it's put in by Krupinski. Michael Krupinski, his first collegiate goal on a play that should have been whistled dead for all intents and purposes. It'll be Ty Matthews who picks up yet another assist. The Beacons have made it 7-0 with 7.03 to play. Got a timeout for post as head coach Peter Whitney just tries to calm things down. Beacons have gotten three goals in quick succession here in the third period to make it 7 nothing. Peter Belay on the opposite side just trying to talk strategy.
7.03 to go before the conclusion of this one. Make sure to stick with us after the contest as UMass Boston will announce the MVP of the tournament. And we will not have an interview with you with head coach Peter Belial or our MVP because of some new COVID protocols, but should have the video of the weekend celebrating this Todd Fishbowl Championship. Would be their first tournament title since January 5th, 2014, when the Beacons defeated Southern New Hampshire for their second consecutive Codfish Bowl title. Beacons have played in four of the six championship games since then, but have lost three of those by a single goal and had scored two goals in all four of those championship games. Not the case today with seven already and still 6.45 to play. UMass Boston, we'll see if they change their style at all here in the final seven minutes. It's not as if you can empty the bench as there's a mini hit on Nicky that ends up with Crapian on the ice. I've seen that a lot where some of these post players are just bouncing off the beacons. Good chance in front and Walker's shot might have caught a piece of the post defenseman and Brown to deny Andy Walker what would have been his third goal of the season. Walker's been busy today. It's Skinner into the zone. Skinner shot from distance. Glove save and Brown will just elect to hold on to it with 5.56 to go. We'd like to thank everybody who's joined us over the past two days. These final two games of the 2021 calendar year here on the Beacons Broadcast Network and Little TV. UMass Boston looking to close out this 56th annual Codfish Bowl. It's just great to have a 56th annual Codfish Bowl tournament after the Beacons did not have a season and obviously a Codfish Bowl last year. One of the oldest running tournaments in all of college hockey and the oldest at the Division III level. Post able to gain the neutral zone, but not much more. Evan Helt's one of those guys for UMass Boston. You could be looking at trying to get that first collegiate goal as Helt leaves it off for Barrett, already has two. He and Ethan Nicken potentially looking for a hat trick here in these final 519. Devin Moran, the Beacons top line left winger, and other of those guys still looking for collegiate goal number one. Pat Keegan, one of the Beacons defensemen. Along, so it's Keegan, Helt, and Moran, the three guys you might see UMass Boston particularly look for when they gain the zone in the offensive zone as there's Helt who just has a player bounce off of him. That time it was Connor Barter. I don't know why Post continues to try to hit some of these bigger beacons. Krupinski, Helt. It hasn't ended well for Post at any point. All of the big hits in this game have come by UMass Boston players. Four forty-five. To go in this 56th annual Codfish Bowl tournament, the shortest Codfish Bowl tournament in Codfish Bowl history. Just two games as Franklin Pierce was forced to pull out of the tournament yesterday, just hours before their scheduled game against this post team, who playing their first ever Codfish Bowl game and they're in the championship game, but things have not gone their way as they trail 7 0 with five different Meekins finding the back of the net thus far. Puck is flipped out, glove down there by Karras. Karras able to find Murphy into the zone, and they're going to say that that is going to come out, and let's see where this face-off will go. Looks like it's going to be center ice. Four twelve. the 
linesman will actually push it just outside of the Beacon's bench and the Beacon's zone. Grolman loses it to Peters. And now it's Petrozella just out of the reach of Peters. Beacons will retreat. Post was really on the back foot in the first period when the Beacons took a 3-0 lead, scoring two goals late, but really dominated the entire period. The second was much closer. And the third started off decently, but three goals in quick succession and made this an absolute rout at 7-0. Raleigh skates it in, and then he is brushed off the puck there by Rowland. Peters with Moran to his left. Peters will keep it, has two options to his right now. Peters for Moran, and he whiffs on the shot looking for his first collegiate goal. Rowland able to find Bankowskis. Bankowskis, backhand shot, and a save for Brown, who, despite the seven goals, Still had himself a decent day. With 3.17 to go, he has already made 49 saves, easily a season high. It was 37 coming into the day. Obviously, the seven goals you don't love to see is that shot from Nick and might have been knocked down by his own player. Atkins was there. Long stretch pass will result in an icing. And with 3.05 to go, we'll go down the other end. The Beacons using a, a mismatched line of Bankowskis, Adkins, and Nickin alongside Osborne and Helt. Bankowskis won it back for Nickin, who's able to keep control of the puck for a bit before finally losing it. Bankowskis absorbs a big hit. That was Connor Barter on the delivering end for post. Nick in able to get around one player. He's looking for that hat trick, and he shoots just wide there and will unhinge the goal from its moorings. Nick in one of those guys who, hey, I've got something left to play for. Coach, give me a couple extra shifts. He was out there with two members of the fourth line. I don't think we've seen Carabelli in this third period he was the player who got injured in the second he's on the bench in uniform which is a positive sign but i don't think the beacons have risked him in the third with the big lead keegan able to find ken cannon just outside his own zone barrett is again playing forward as with Carabelli and I think Duncan was another guy who took a big hit late in the second period. So it's Bordeaux already with two assists looking for Barrett who didn't quite charge towards the net. So Barrett who's got a pair of goals today getting an extra shift and it's Barrett here looking for a shot. No goes back door looking for Bordeaux and Bordeaux was tied up. Going the other way, it's Patrick Murphy will take a shot that goes wide of the net. Sam Best directing traffic. The Woburn native has played all 118 minutes thus far of this Codfish Bowl tournament. Can easily say he's the only guy who's done that. Probably the only player in the history of the Codfish Bowl and it's a record that will never change that has played every minute of every game in one single tournament. Skinner had the puck deflected away as he was looking to come up with some fancy stick work. Going the other way with it is Tommy Boyce who had one of those two great breakaway chances in the second period that could have gotten Post back into the game when it was just 4-0. Stretch pass, finds the stick of Nickin, but doesn't go much further. So we're under a minute to go in this 56th annual Codfish Bowl tournament. Help for Nickin. Nickin tries to bull his way through two players. Brown's just going to hold on to the puck. Never covered up, never moved. And we've got a whistle. 
and I believe an offensive zone draw. Skinner tried to win that face off with Evan Help now getting a chance to play on the power plays. We've got a cross checking penalty against Trey DeLore, giving the Beacons a one final power play chance. And with Helt playing in his final Codfish Bowl game, still looking for that first Codfish Bowl for that first goal as Skinner whiffs on the chance in tight. Why not give Helt a rare shift on the power play? Down to 15 seconds left. This should just about do it, and Joe Petrozella is not going to even elect to move the puck. He's just going to sit behind his own net, and that will do it. UMass Boston, a dominant two days in the 56th Annual Codfish Bowl Tournament. 5-0 yesterday, 7-0 today over the post-University Eagles. It didn't look like a typical Codfish Bowl, but what looks typical during the time of COVID, UMass Boston took care of the two teams they had to play, Five different goal scorers yesterday, five different goal scorers today. Two goals each from Nolan Barrett and Ethan Nicken. Another shutout from Sam Best. We're going to take a brief audio break, bring you the final statistics, the MVP, and the championship photo, and then we'll wrap it up from Beaconville here in 2021 as UMass Boston picks up their seventh win of the season. They move to 7-5-1, post falls to 4-6. So right now we're going to begin the championship trophy presentation of the 56th Annual Codfish Bowl Tournament. As UMass Boston Assistant Athletic Director for Sports Information, David Wahlberg, is going to be giving out the trophies here. The Lawrence F. Kern Award given to the player who exhibits the most and best sportsmanship over the two days of the tournament. Almost always given to a beacon. And the winner will be graduate student captain Evan Helt. Always one of the hardest workers on this beacons team. And Helt... Picks up some hardware before we find out the tournament MVP. And it'll be Sam Best, the Beacons junior goaltender, who before this tournament started, we weren't sure who would be starting for the Beacons. Best gets the call both days. 11 saves yesterday, 21 today, 32 saves over two days to earn the Godfish Bowl tournament MVP. Now we'll see... Evan Helt, the Beacons captain, come out and get the championship trophy. And we'll stick with it as the Beacons take their championship photos before we wrap it up. UMass Boston will get to celebrate their sixth ever Codfish Bowl title. It ties them with Boston State for the second most Codfish Bowl titles in the history of the Codfish Bowl. They trail only Salem State, who has eight overall titles as it looks like the team's going to take a photo right below us. And then we'll wrap it up quickly, bringing the final stats.
some of the beacon scratches running out onto the ice making sure to get into the photo First championship celebration since January 5th, 2014 in the Codfish Bowl. The Beacons have certainly won other hardware, winning a couple of regular season titles, a couple of tournament titles, uh, and even a trip to the Frozen Four. Really quickly, let's take a look at the final stats from this one. UMass Boston, a 7-0 winner, out shooting post 56-21. 49 saves for Brandon Brown, 21 for Sam Best, who moves to 5-3-1 and one on the year. Post did not win the faceoffs, ended up heavily in the Beacons' favor, 43 of 77 on the power play. The Beacons finished 2-5, for five, Post 0-1. for one. I'd like to give a shout-out to our production crew, the same group working both games this week. Uh, Gina Albano on camera, Tam Landry, our director. Thanks so much for everyone involved with this Codfish Bowl, and, and thank you for watching. Uh, UMass Boston will be back in action on January the 7th against Skidmore. That's Friday, January 7th, of course. That, that's if the world lets us. For now, the Beacons go into 2022 on a high note, their sixth-ever Codfish Bowl title with a 7-0 victory over post.